Thank you very much for being here this afternoon. Um, my name is Marietje Schaak. I'm a member of the European Parliament for the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats for Europe, a Dutch political party called D66. And uh, the reason why we're uh, hosting this event together with my colleague Ifailo Kalfin with the uh, Socialist and Democrat group of this parliament who will introduce some thoughts uh, soon is that we've seen a very um, very lively but also complex discussion taking place about ACTA over the past couple of months and uh, some people have said that ACTA is now dead uh, I can assure you it is not. Uh, it ain't over till it's over. Uh, the final vote still has to be cast. Um, but it would help uh, to have a more inclusive discussion by stakeholders who uh, would be greatly impacted if ACTA would be ratified, but who have not always had a seat at the table or whose voices have not been heard. Uh, some voices were very loud, some topics were very well represented, others, others were not. Uh, we also saw in the discussion that sometimes the uh, facts upon which some groups, activists, uh, based themselves were not 100% accurate, and that has complicated the discussion uh, for those of us who are critical uh, of ACTA. So today is also an opportunity to sort of set the record straight. We're here today to uh, hear from stakeholders who will share their thoughts. Uh, we are here to learn. Uh, you all are here and uh, we have a web stream and I've already seen on Twitter that a lot of people uh, are following, so I'm very happy about that too. Uh, a few practical remarks. Uh, we've made Wi-Fi available for guests. Uh, the username is servicedesk09, then the password JJ2OTWF. N. And I would suggest that we use the hashtag ACTA-ST for stakeholders, so ACTA-ST, so that we can all tweet and uh, be involved that way. So I would now like to ask uh, Ifailo to say a few uh, words, and then we'll get started with the first panel. Thank you very much, uh, Marietta, and thank you very much uh, to all of you that uh, took your time to be here today and to take part in the discussion. Uh, given the fact that uh, ACTA was an agreement that was uh, uh, negotiated in secrecy practically behind closed doors, uh, uh, the Commission is not very happy with this uh, uh, finding, but the fact is that uh, we all knew that there are negotiations, uh, we all knew what was the ultimate goal of these negotiations, uh, but uh, the texts uh, over this year since uh, 2008 were mostly leaked and uh, everything that has been discussed uh, uh, was uh, in most of the, uh, on the most of the occasions, uh, uh, leaked through different various channels. Also, these negotiations for ACT uh, bypassed uh, the existing international organizations like WIPO and uh, ITU uh, that already have an established uh, uh, mechanism to consult stakeholders. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, the fact is that the stakeholders were not properly discussed, uh, and this is, uh, this is our uh, uh, opinion, when ACTA was uh, negotiated uh, between the member states. Now we come at a stage where the parliament has to say it's, uh, it's worth on it. And uh, we try to compensate uh, uh, everything that hasn't been done so far. And uh, one of the most important things, this is to see and to hear the arguments of uh, various stakeholders that uh, have to say something on ACTA. And uh, I can assure you that the parliament is not going to, uh, uh, to take its final decision uh, without uh, taking into consideration uh, the stakeholders' opinions. There are various uh, initiatives uh, that are organized. Uh, uh, I'm very happy that we have a very uh, representative uh, uh, participation from uh, NGOs and different stakeholders at this meeting today. Uh, I would mention uh, another meeting uh, tomorrow morning organized by my group, by the Socialists and Democrats on the same issue of a factor. There will be uh, most probably further events uh, with the idea to turn to the European Court of Justice uh, being dropped. I expect that the final uh, position of the Parliament on ACT is going to be taken by, uh, by July, by the summer. Uh, and I think that uh, the committees uh, are already uh, prepared to produce opinions. Uh, I'm serving on the Industry and Technology Committee, and I hope that very soon uh, we shall discuss the opinion of this committee on, on ACTA. 
But uh, without uh, further delaying, again, uh, thank you very much uh, for being here. And uh, I, I really think that the Parliament, the European Parliament, uh, uh, has to listen to the stakeholders uh, before taking uh, its decision. And uh, I'm very happy that uh, we uh, were able to organize this event with Mariette. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ifalo. And to make this parade of opinions of stakeholders uh, a little bit manageable, we've divided it in a few uh, subjects. We'll start with a panel on access to knowledge. Then there will be a panel on fundamental rights. There will be a presentation by Mike Masnick on his report, The Sky is Rising. Uh, then we will discuss uh, concerns from the internet or digital rights community. Um, we'll talk about access to medicines and then uh, there will be conclusions um, by uh, a representative of the Council of Europe and the European Group on Ethics in ICT. But I'll come back to that. The first panel uh, will deal with access to knowledge. And there are several organizations that are very concerned about the effect that ACTA would have on the ability uh, of people to access information. And access to information is a very important fundamental right. The nature of ACTA would actually uh, raise liability for intermediaries and uh, we've heard from several of these intermediaries that they're uh, not excited out about being forced into sort of policing uh, the internet or um, enforcing the law. First like to introduce uh, Jamie Love with the Knowledge Ecology Online Organization, where he is the director. I'm sure you've seen their work because they've been very active in this uh, discussion. Jamie is also the uh, US co-chair of the Transatlantic Consumer Dialogue, uh, and he's in the Intellectual Property Policy Committee, uh, and he's chairing the Essential Inventions Board of Directors. He is an advisor of a number of uh, uh, important organizations at the United Nations, but also governments and uh, uh, all kinds of other intergovernmental, non-governmental organizations, uh, public health, etc. He's written a lot on innovation and intellectual property rights, uh, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much. I, I, I'd like to be, um, I've identified several points I want to hit in my brief, brief period uh, here. Um, one is that the fact that the agreement was negotiated in secret uh, and there was very limited access by consumer groups uh, and the general public to negotiations, I don't think was really an accident. I, I mean, it was, it was uh, the opinion of a lot of people that ACTA was launched in, in response to reforms that were undertaken at the World Intellectual Property Organization, which really opened up the organization by liberalizing their accreditation procedure and giving uh, consumer groups and uh, free software organizations, all sorts of public interest and development groups, much more access to the to discussions. And the consequences were a change in the outcomes of those negotiations. So I think that the right owner groups that had, had really pushed the act to process, particularly the copyright industry, were really interested in having something that was really closed off. In addition to the text, only uh, the negotiation started in 2007. The first text that was publicly released because of pressure from the European Parliament was put out in April 2010. But also they were not making public the list of the people that attended the negotiations, so you didn't really know who the negotiators were. And there was very limited ability to meet with negotiators. Often when they were forced to open up a little bit and not make the venue secret, uh, they'd give very short notice when they let people know when the meetings were, uh, where the meetings were actually taking place or when you could meet with people, sometimes within 24 hours. And for an international negotiation, it was extremely difficult for the general public to make arrangements on such short notice. So it was really designed to really exclude the general public. And I think that undermined the legitimacy of the agreement. And I think it changed the outcome in, in really negative ways. And I also think that if you, if you endorse the treaty at the parliament level, in a way you've endorsed the process as well as the substance, and I think that's, that's quite important. Uh, uh, secondly, I want to say that a number of rough edges in the agreement were indeed fixed in the final six months in particular of the negotiation or following the public release of the negotiation. Uh, uh, and I think a lot of people have, 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 have pointed to that. Certainly it's a case that by making patents optional in the agreement that, that it actually address some of the complaints about the agreement and some of the text was changed uh, so 
uh, some of the provisions were narrowed in the final negotiations. And those were, I think, all helpful areas. But it, it still remains that there are problems in the, in the text that emerges, that it, which, which, which I will cover. One of the problems is that in the area of remedies for infringements, the approach is to, is, to, is to try and ramp up the standards over what were you'd find in previous agreements like the World Trade Organization uh, TRIPS agreement, uh, and to look at state practice uh, across the board and try and find essentially the more aggressive practices that they could find, in some cases even going beyond anything we could find in state practice. And where that really becomes problematic is in areas where uh, it, 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 it's, it's beneficial to have some exceptions to a general norm. So in an area where even a general norm may be a reasonable outcome for most cases, it may not be an acceptable outcome for all cases. And the act it tends to not, it wasn't very, uh, it wasn't very forgiving in terms of these areas of exceptions on remedies. And I will say that there was language that was proposed in the negotiations by Australia and New Zealand and Canada in various times to permit more flexibility by creating exceptions to the general rule, and those were consistently opposed by the European Union and the United States government, and that's unfortunate. Uh, uh, we proposed at one point that exceptions be permitted to the general remedies as long as they're provided in, the, in this committee they were setting up the active committee and reported, so you could essentially not, not, not sort of force down as, uh, such an inflexible system. Now, I'm going to mention one in particular, and that's the area of damages where we're really quite concerned. ACTA had these provisions that you have to give the right owners the, uh, the right to present in a, in a judicial proceeding what they call any legitimate measure of value the right owner submits, and they included such things specifically as the suggested retail price of the article or, or market price. These, these were language we didn't find in any national laws that we look, this issues of, you know, having to rely on things like suggested retail price, which are rarely the actual price that companies actually get for anything. And a lot of the uses where you're going to have people who are concerned about are, are areas where the kind of uses people were have would be, never would have took place in the first place if anybody was facing uh, the suggested retail price. It has the effect of, uh, of ramping up the damages across the board of chilling uh, uh, the entry into the certain services where people feel they may have some liability or some exposure in some areas because they become just very costly and aggressive. Now, in the in the areas that we're concerned about, one is, you know, there, 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 there's, there's a whole, by ramping up the infringement penalties, particularly in areas where you see things like peer-to-peer uh, -peer activity or social networks or things like that. A lot of what people are doing right now on the internet involves sharing of information. Uh, a company was just sold for a billion dollars recently that's basically the, the function is sharing photographs. Uh, uh, there's a lot of areas where the people providing the services are valuable services. It's a dynamic sector of the economy. It's something that people depend upon. That they, they rely on it a lot of times now for information as much as they do newspapers. It's uh, becoming a very important part, and it's, 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 it's creating a lot of value in this society. And if you get the balance wrong, if you get the liabilities wrong, it really kind of knocks those things down. It stops you from the development of these kind of services. Now, one thing that in the reforms that a lot of people have pushed for in the copyright area, is to, is to consider that for certain kinds of uses of copyrighted works that, that e an appropriate thing would be to be more liberal about the ability for people to have the freedom to use things even when it constitutes infringement and to set some uh, s statutory caps or some reasonable limits on the infringement of works in certain cases, creating what are called liability rules, particularly in areas where you think that uh, that it's just as unworkable to work around uh, uh, the, the traditional way people thought about copyright on, on permissions and things like that. But this whole area of liability rules, there's two different ways you can approach these things. You can try to d identify these things as uh, essentially some kind of compulsory licensing regime, which in the area of copyright requires you to go through in some cases a very tough three-step test of the, of, 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 of part two of the, of the trips, 
um, which is which 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 is is highly problematic from a legal point of view in terms of international trade point of view. But a different way is to put limitations on the remedies that you apply to infringement under Part 3 of the TRIPS. And I think this distinction between Part 2 of the TRIPS and Part 3 of the TRIPS, even though it's a technical issue, is really, really important. It goes to the root and the heart of what ACTA did. What ACTA did is it reduced the flexibility that countries have to liberalize access to copyrighted work under Part 3 of the TRIPS. And it forces people really to deal with the part two uh, procedures, which are which for for th a lot of things like social networks or access to orphan copyrighted works and things like that, are are are, are problematic and very difficult. I'm I'm short on time. I'll just wind up with a, a comment on the action committee, and that is that in addition to the agreement itself, there's of course this committee that's being set up that has this broad mandate to provide technical assistance, best practices, norms. I know in the, in, 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 during the negotiation, a lot of people said, look at, okay, the negotiations have been secret, you've kept consumers out, you've done all this sort of thing. Can you provide some kind of guarantees in writing in the agreement that the committee itself will operate in an open, inclusive, and transparent manner? That was rejected, and we couldn't believe they were rejecting it. We we're going like, well, you know, you're, you know, you're operating in this outrageous manner to get here, and you've got all this credibility and legitimacy problem. It would just seem like to be in your interest to make people more relaxed and confident that the ACTA committee wouldn't operate in exactly the same way that the negotiations took place if you would just put it down in paper and not just give us a verbal promise, but actually make it part of the, part of the agreement. The United States wouldn't even put that in the signing statement when they, when, they, when they signed the agreement. They wouldn't even make any written promises that they, would, that they would press for anything like that. And if you want to know why we're concerned about that, you'd have to look at the way the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement's being negotiated by Canada and the United States and Australia and several of the active members right now, completely in secret. They've just now canceled the ability of people to make presentation to negotiators at the next round of negotiations in Texas. And, we just sort of see this climate of the public doesn't count, the public doesn't really have a voice, the public can't see the text, the public can't be in the room, the public can't even know when the meetings are being held or the venues, they get things canceled and hotels are reorganized. It's really insulting and I think it's just, it's just one more reason why ACT is a flawed agreement and it really should not be approved by the European Parliament. Thank you. Thank you, James, for sticking to time and um, uh, the reason why we have this meeting uh, openly available, streamed, and transparently is, is to be sort of a counterbalance, although uh, small, hopefully, it can make a difference. Uh, and I do think that voices are being heard also uh, through, through um, notes that people send with their concerns. So uh, I would all encourage people to, to continue to share their thoughts. We're now going to listen to a video statement by Stuart Hamilton, who is with IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, which is a leading international body representing the interests of library and information services and their users. Uh, and it is the global voice for um, the library and information profession. Uh, broadly speaking, Stuart Hamilton is the Director of Advocacy and Public Policy at IFLA, but uh, their global library community is actually uh, in a consultation in Canada, so he couldn't be here, but we're very happy that the um, digital presentation uh, will start right now. So there's a video. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Stuart Hamilton, and I am the Director of Policy and Advocacy at the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, or IFLA. Before I begin, I would like to thank the organisers of this event, in particular MEPs Sharka and Calvin, uh, for giving IFLA the opportunity to contribute to the debate surrounding ACTA. IFLA is the global voice of the international library community, with members in over 150 countries, including 46 in Europe. We represent the world's library associations, national libraries, and many other types of library worldwide, where over 750,000 library and information professionals work. We help our members provide the best services to more than 1 billion registered library users on the planet. Libraries are explicitly connected to national and international copyright systems. We play an important role in both preserving and making available access to information 
that is in copyright or the public domain. In this context, IFLA understands and respects the role that copyright plays in information creation and dissemination around the world, and our members place the highest emphasis on compliance with copyright principles and regulations. In doing so, IFLA members understand that copyright must provide for a fair and profitable balance between the needs of information users and society at large and the commercial imperatives of creators and content providers. Which brings us to ACTA. While IFLA commends efforts to combat systematic commercial counterfeiting, we are concerned that ACTA poses a threat to the balance of copyright. Let us be clear, ACTA is a pure enforcement agreement that will have effects on copyright in the international arena. Therefore, the first point that IFLA wishes to make is that the best forum for any discussions of this magnitude is the World Intellectual Property Organization, or WIPO, where it is possible to ensure the participation of a wide variety of stakeholders. The lack of transparency throughout the drafting of the agreement has developed mistrust amongst many of those who were not consulted at any stage of the agreement's genesis. As Senator Ron Wyden in the US has said, when international accords like ACTA are conceived and constructed under a cloak of secrecy, it is hard to argue that they represent the interests of the general public. The second point that IFLA would like to make concerns secondary liability. While we recognise that language changed throughout the drafting process to become somewhat less alarming, we are nevertheless concerned that with the potential harmful benefits of any legislation that targets intermediaries. For example, libraries in the UK are still in a state of uncertainty relating to the Digital Economy Act, which could hold public and university libraries liable for the actions of their users. To prevent liability, libraries could be required to install expensive monitoring equipment to monitor their networks for copyright infringement and essentially look over the shoulders of users seeking information. As Michael Geist has recently pointed out, while many countries have codified secondary liability principles within their domestic laws, there are relatively few provisions aimed at secondary liability in international law. We are concerned that any new legislation in this area will undoubtedly lead to further situations where libraries are held liable for the information seeking activities of their users. Finally, we wish to comment on the course that ACTA maintains, that of passing more and more anti-piracy and enforcement laws while paying little to no attention to the idea that copyright should be balanced. While 15 anti-piracy laws have been passed in the United States in the past 30 years, and the length of copyright term has been extended all over the world, including the EU, we have made far less progress in creating flexibility in copyright, particularly in the digital age. ACTA compounds the problem by limiting flexibility going forward. At this point, we have no ideas what technologies are going to emerge in the next decade, and ACTA will lock us into an approach which is not suitable for now, let alone the future. In summary, IFLA is gravely concerned by the extreme secrecy surrounding ACTA and its negotiations, the potentially chilling effects of targeting intermediaries, and the continuing focus on enforcement at the expense of flexibility. While we are now at a very late stage in the process, IFLA urges the members of the European Parliament to have a robust and open debate on ACTA and to discuss all issues, including public access to information via the internet, when the issue of how to move forward with the ratification process is considered. Thank you very much. That was Stuart Hamilton. Now we will hear from Lucie Morion. She is with Reporters Without Borders, uh, which is a French 
France-based international NGO uh, focusing on press freedom, uh, freedom of information, and also digital freedoms or internet freedom. Um, Lucy is the head of the new media desk at Reporters Without Borders, and she deals with monitoring online freedom of expression and advocating for the release of online reporters, bloggers, and netizens who have been imprisoned for speaking freely on the internet. Thanks, Lucy. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you for organizing this important uh, stakeholder um, hearing and, uh, and thanks for consulting us on, the, on this issue. When I first came across ACTA a few years ago, I have, to, I have to say that I was wondering what Reporters Without Borders would have to do with, with such a commercial treaty. Uh, but then we were alerted by the NGO La Quadrature du Net on the dangers of ACTA and we looked at it more closely and what we found out we, did, we didn't like. Uh, clearly Reporters Without Borders recognizes the need to protect intellectual property uh, but we believe it has to be adapted to the digital age and we believe that the ACTA agreement is uh, the wrong solution. We believe that ACTA as it stands today does endanger freedom of information online and freedom of expression online in the, in the name of the fight against copyright infringement. We, of course, we were very uh, worried about the lack of transparency uh, the, uh, of the entire process. As one of the panelists was saying before, uh, clearly the general public was left out of the negotiations. And for us NGOs, we were deprived of tools to put pressure on the different governments uh, to, to make our voices heard. And there were, of course, leaked versions that uh, were published, but uh, we were expecting more transparency for, about such an important uh, agreement. But the main issues we have with, uh, with ACTA, uh, we believe that this agreement contains a number of provisions that could pose a threat to uh, freedom uh, of expression online and freedom of information, especially Article 27.3 that calls for cooperation between right holders and, and ISPs. We wonder what kind of cooperation this can be when we know that at the same time the agreement calls for uh, civil sanctions, we mentioned the damages before, um, or criminal sanctions for aiding and abating infringement, which is a very wide definition. Um, we believe that this article stresses the liability of internet technical intermediaries, which is a, a very important issue uh, because it turned them uh, into copyright police in charge of surveillance and penalties application. Private actors would then have to take decisions that do impact the free flow of information online in an arbitrary manner without any proper judicial overview. In his June 2011 report, uh, UN Special Reporter on Freedom of Expression, Mr. Frank Larue, uh, mentioned regarding this, this issue that holding intermediaries liable for the content disseminated or created by their users severely undermines the enjoyment of the right to freedom of information and expression because it leads to self-protected and overbroad private censorship, often without transparency and the due process of law. That's exactly the point here. There is also a real danger that the technical intermediaries would remove content they regard as potentially illegal to avoid prosecution, and resulting in arbitrary decisions that offer little protection for the rights of Internet users. And those intermediaries could also be required to uh, prevent the circulation of content that violates copyright, which would open the door to the introduction of internet uh, filtering or monitoring mechanism. And this is really something we are worried about. Um, the European Court of Justice recently uh, ruled that generalized uh, internet filtering violates the fundamental rights of European citizens, including the right to the free flow of information online. Another, another problem we have with this agreement is the protection of personal data. Uh, Article 27.4 would basically allow copyright holders to, add, to ask ISPs to identify suspected violators of intellectual property rights. This threatens the protection of personal information and if we take into account the fact that ACTA if passed, could be extended to countries, to authoritarian countries, then this would potentially endanger dissidents, journalists, and human rights activists. We know uh, how much China, Syria, and Iran, just to give a few names of countries, um, can be 
able to take any action to get to uh, the networks of dissidents to, to try to, to go after those who are uh, trying to send information different from what the government is doing and we do we would we would hate to see uh, this kind of personal data in the hands of uh, of this government uh, because of a private corporation um, it is true that this article is non-binding it uses the may verb but this could be changed further by way of amendment and this is going to be my last point we also uh, we are very worried also about article 36 that creates the acta committee which will be able to change the agreement after it has been accepted by the different countries. It has the competence to review amendments to ACTA, bypassing elected representative and the, the democratic process. So, um, well, at a time when more and more bills are passed, drafted, introduced in parliaments of democratic countries, I have in mind SOPA and PIPA in the US, now CISPA, also the three strikes law in France, it is important that the European Parliament sets an example by rejecting a treaty that would endanger freedom of expression. And as you all know, there have been many protests all over Europe these past weeks and months, it continues now, to denounce ACTA. It's important that the European Parliament hears the citizen opposition to ACTA and sticks to the original timetable to vote on ACTA and reject it by the summer. Thank you. Now we move to the next uh, next panel, which is uh, uh, where we, we shall hear uh, two representatives of two very important organizations that are uh, dealing with uh, fundamental rights and that are very well known. The first speaker is going to be Gabrielle uh, Guillemin. Uh, she uh, joined uh, Article 19 as a legal advisor in uh, 2011. Before that, uh, Gabrielle uh, used to work at the European uh, Court of Human Rights as a lawyer. Um, and uh, the organization, Article 19, for those of you who are not uh, familiar, I would uh, just summarize that this is an organization against the silence, uh, asking and fighting for the right of the people to uh, expression and the right uh, and the freedom to expression and the, the, the right to, 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 to present uh, the views of everyone. So without uh, further talking, I give the word to Gabriela. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, thank you very much uh, for inviting Article 19 to this very important event. Um, I'm here to speak to you today uh, about how ACTA breaches uh, fundamental rights and, in particular, freedom of expression. We share many of the concerns that have already been expressed by uh, the speakers here today on the panel. Uh, Article 19 has three main criticisms um, of ACTA. The first is that ACTA fails adequately to protect freedom of expression. The second is that the criminal provisions in ACTA lack uh, the legal certainty required under international law under Article 10 of the European Convention of Human Rights uh, as well as Article 52 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights. And thirdly, ACTA promotes the private enforcement of intellectual property rights at the expense of freedom of expression, the right to privacy, and due process. Now, turning back to uh, my first, uh, our first point about the imbalance in, in favor of intellectual property rights rather than fundamental rights. This is very well illustrated by the fact that in the text of ACTA, intellectual property rights are mentioned no less than 43 times. Fundamental rights, by contrast, are not mentioned. Freedom of expression is mentioned twice as a fundamental principle rather than as a right or as a fundamental uh, freedom, despite the fact that it is recognized as such under Article 10 of the European Convention or under Article 11 of the EU Charter of F Fundamental Rights. And finally, there is no overarching provision in ACTA protecting freedom of expression. Our second criticism concerns the lack of legal certainty of the criminal provisions uh, in ACTA, which is in breach of the requirements, amongst others, of Article 10, Paragraph 2 of the European Convention on Human Rights and Article 52 uh, of the Charter. This requirement is that of a um, sound legal basis, so that should be sufficiently clear that is missing in ACTA, and in particular, 
we are concerned that key terms in the criminal provisions remain undefined. Commercial scale. ACTA requires states to criminalize copyright infringement on a commercial scale, which is defined as including at least these acts carried out as commercial activities for direct or indirect commercial advantage. This is a very broad provision which could potentially encompass trivial copyright infringement. It is also telling that it does not contain some of the safeguards concerning, for example, and, con and consumers um, acting in good faith, whereas this safeguard is to be found in Recital 14 of the Intellectual Property Rights Enforcement uh, Directive. It does not feature an ACTA. ACTA further requires states to provide penalties for aiding and abetting commercial scale infringement. Again, there is no requirement of uh, intent and there is no uh, reference that these acts should be committed for direct or indirect economic gain. So again, it provides a potentially a variable basis for imposing strict liability on intermediaries. Our third main criticism concerns the private enforcement of intellectual property rights by intermediaries in breach of freedom of expression, the right to privacy, and due process. Article 27.3 of ACTA refers to cooperative efforts which are not defined, so it is not clear what, what this means. But since ACTA is meant as an enforcement treaty, one which re refers also to the prevention of copyright infringement, it is hard to escape the conclusion that in practice, the way in which th these cooperative efforts should be carried out would be by carrying out mass surveillance of uh, internet subscribers in clear breach of their right to privacy and by the same token having a free chilling effect on freedom of expression. And as was already mentioned, this is something that the, Euro the Court of Justice of the European Union said uh, is uh, unacceptable. Finally, due process. Article 27.4 uh, of ACTA effectively uh, en encourages states uh, to adopt procedures that would pressure intermediaries to disclose the details of their customers, and this without the required safeguards under international human rights law. In particular, um, uh, the, the, um, it would be uh, left to law enforcement authorities to uh, scrutinize a request for the details of internet customers. That for us is a big problem and is in breach of due process. Um, so in conclusion, um, freedom of expression is inadequately protected uh, under ACTA. Um, intellectual property rights should not be protected at the expense of freedom of expression. And finally, any uh, intellectual property rights enforcement framework should comply with the requirements of international human rights law. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gabriel. Uh, now uh, I pass the floor to Marianne Molman. Uh, she is uh, senior policy ad uh, advisor with Amnesty International. I don't need to, to, to present to you Amnesty International. Uh, just uh, a word about uh, Marianne. She uh, is uh, working for Amnesty International in the headquarters in London. Before that, uh, she has been working as a, a women's rights uh, defender for over eight years with Human Rights Watch, uh, again, a very notorious NGO uh, in uh, their office in New York. You have the floor, again. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for inviting Amnesty International to present our concerns, or some of our concerns, um, with the ACTA as it currently stands and as before the European Parliament. Um, I uh, am planning to speak about issues that have already been raised, and so I'm going to be very quick, I hope, but potentially um, consolidate maybe a little bit the, the main concerns. I think it's, a, it's telling that all of the panelists so far have raised very similar concerns. Every time you read the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, um, you'll be struck by the visionary and comprehensive nature of a document that was adopted over 50 years ago. 
not only, only did the drafters of this document understand that we all have very similar needs and desires as human beings, but they also saw that what brings us together is our need to be unique. In essence, we all want to be safe, we want to be healthy, we want to be free, and we want to develop and express and share our unique beliefs and thoughts in peace. It is Amnesty International's mandate and raison d'etre to defend this vision through research, legal analysis, grassroots pressure, and advocacy. And it is this vision that is at stake in the current debate over the ACTA. So this sounds like a very technical conversation, but it is the vision that was set out in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that is at stake. Our analysis of the ACTA provisions as they are before the European Parliament right now does not convince us that the ACTA strikes a fair balance between the various human rights that are impacted by this agreement, and there are many. The rights at stake include the right to freedom of expression, the right to health, the right to due process and fair trial, and the right of an author to benefit from the protection of the moral and material interests resulting from any scientific, literary, and artistic production. This is also a human right. So these are all human rights that need to be balanced, and they are not in the ACTA. I'm going to highlight two concerns that are at the heart of Amnesty International's opposition to the EU ratifying this treaty. We have many other concerns, but I am going to highlight only two, not to um, tire you or bore you. First, the issue of freedom of expression and information. Um, it has already been, been brought up that international human rights law protects the right to freedom of expression, and it includes in this protection the right to receive, impart, and seek information and ideas. The Act has threatens these rights in many ways. The agreement requires members to lower the criminal threshold for intellectual property rights infringements and widen the scope of the criminal offenses without a fair use clause, or what is known in European law as a de minimis uh, clause. This will stifle free informal data exchange between individuals through the potential criminalization of trivial and small scale infringements. So it's sort of, uh, yeah, well, the way that it's, it was always explained to me at law school is if you have a million dollar suit, you know, ten dollars is de minimis. That's sort of fair use. A second uh, concern are due process and fair trial issues, including the right to have a criminal conviction reviewed by a higher instance. This right is particularly threatened by the agreement's overbroad and vague provisions. Um, and it raises a number of specific concerns, and I will emphasize only a few. ACTA shifts the liability, we've already heard this, for intellectual property rights infringements from the direct infringer to, for example, an internet service provider. This creates an incentive for service providers um, or intermediaries to cut off suspected intellectual property rights violators preemptively without due process. ACTA encourages private entities to become the main implementers, in fact, of ACTA provisions, even the provisions of criminal offenses. And in this way, it pushes for processes largely outside the formal legal system. This privatization of policing directly infringes on the right to privacy as companies, especially if they're facing fines or other sanctions, will err on the side of monitoring too much rather than too little. And many of service providers have already raised their concerns um, with, with their responsibilities in this regard. The privatization of oversight and policing also opens the way to practices that circumvent due process and proper judicial review. In many cases, the interpretation of laws and rights requires a very delicate assessment of facts and balancing of rights that should be carried out by a judge or a court and with all the fair trial safeguards. This kind of careful review is precisely what we have rightly come to associate with um, democracy and the rule of law. The ACTA, as it currently stands before the European Parliament for an up or down vote, erodes the rule of law, and in this way, it erodes democracy. It's noteworthy that the privatization of enforcement of criminal law also was highlighted by a, as, as a concern by the Council of Europe Commissioner for Human Rights in his paper on social media and human rights from September of uh, last, last year. 
So um, without clear provisions stressing a need for balancing all fundamental rights, ACTA is incompatible with fair trial guarantees in the European Convention on Human Rights and the Charter of Fundamental Rights. Amnesty International is bound by our mandate and our members to help uphold the principles and standards set out in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The European Union also has a mandate to uphold and also has members to be accountable to. Amongst other things, the Union must ensure that any agreement negotiated with third countries respects and upholds fundamental rights, including the right to freedom of expression and information, the right to privacy, the right to protection of personal data, the right to health, and the rights to fair trial and due process. And ACTA does not do this. This is the reason the European Union should say no to ACTA as it stands before it. Thank you. Thank you. Very convincing. I'm passing the floor to Mariette for introducing a very interesting presentation. Thank you very much <clears throat> to all speakers. Uh, a lot has been raised. Uh, our next guest is going to uh, take a completely different perspective. Uh, he is uh, Mike Masnick. Some would simply introduce him by saying he's a rock star, but he is also the CEO and founder of Tech Dirt, a web blog that focuses on technology news and tech-related issues. He uh, is the founder and CEO of the company uh, called Floor64 and a contributor at Business Week's Business Exchange. He has recently published a study uh, that I've read with great interest, and I hope you all will too. Uh, the study is called The Sky is Rising. The entertainment industry is large and growing, not shrinking. And this study finds that the entertainment sector is doing increasingly well. Calls for increased enforcement of intellectual property rights through treaties such as ACTA would therefore be unfounded and disproportional, according to the study, and we look forward to hearing more. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to present here today uh, on what I think is a, a very important topic, and I think uh, most of the, the folks here agree. Um, as pretty much everyone has discussed today, um, there were very big concerns about how uh, ACTA was negotiated um, in secret and without transparency, and that raised a lot of issues certainly about the process, um, but beyond that I think it also raised serious concerns about what got left out of the discussion. Um, and certainly part of that was the view of key stakeholders, which is what uh, we've been hearing today um, from many of those key stakeholders who were, who were left out of that discussion, but it, it also left out many of the facts uh, and data about what is actually happening around the world. And this is important because when it comes to policy questions around uh, copyright and other intellectual property issues, it is very common to make some very big assumptions that aren't necessarily fact-based. So that includes things like insisting that such laws automatically, without question, help creators, and that insisting that if such laws automatically help creators, that expanding such laws will automatically help creators even more. Unfortunately, the research on this is lacking, and in fact, often the evidence suggests otherwise. And we think that policy making uh, should be based on facts and data rather than pure assumptions. And so what we wanted to do was to bring more data and more evidence into the discussion and on the belief that policy making should be evidence based and not faith based. That led us to write The Sky is Rising Report, which is a careful and detailed look at the true state of the content industry today uh, and how it has changed, uh, specifically over the past decade. We looked at the global market, specifically for music, movies, books, and video games, and we went through a number of different sources to compare what information we could find. Where possible, we used the industry's own numbers. Um, in other cases, we used uh, numbers that only which we found to be as credible as possible. That includes things like the United Nations, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, um, respectable research organizations like Price Waterhouse Coopers. And what we found when we looked at all of this information was that the sky is very much rising, not falling. That the industry, both in total and all four of those separate segments of the industry, are growing, not shrinking that more content is being produced than ever before, that more content is available to the public than ever before, and that there are more options for both consumers and creators than ever before. It is easier to create, for content creators to create, to distribute, to promote, and to monetize than ever before, and that consumers are spending more on entertainment. In short, what we found is that the overall industry is, is thriving. In terms of size, all of these industries, all of the segments of the overall industry 
uh, are growing. The overall, the entire industry grew from 449 billion to 745 billion in value from 1995 to 2010. The video market has continued to grow massively over the same period from 180 billion to over 300 billion today. The book market, global book, mar book market, grew from 100 billion to 109 billion from 2004 to 2010. The music market, the one that is often used as an example of where there are the most struggles, actually grew from 132 billion to 168 billion from 2005 until 2010. And that's actually based on numbers from the IFPI, which is the industry's own representative. And the video game market has grown massively. Uh, it's the fastest growing. It's the smallest of, the, of these four, but it's the fastest growing. It grew from 20 billion to over 70 billion from 2000 to 2011. And what we found, though, is not only are these markets growing in terms of dollar size, but they're growing in terms of the amount of content produced, and often exponentially so. In 1995, there were 1,700 feature films made worldwide. By 2009, that number was about 7,200. That's an increase of more than four times as many feature films were being made. Um, much of that growth is actually coming from uh, some emerging markets. And of course, video these days is no longer just about TV and film, but also we're seeing tons of internet video. Uh, YouTube today has over 60 hours of video uploaded every single minute, and that number keeps growing. Last year it was 48 hours, this year it is 60. The book market is also growing at an incredible rate. In 2002, 250,000 books, one quarter of a million, were published. In 2010, that number was 3 million. Now, many of these are self-published, or what are considered non-traditional books, but even if you look at the traditional book space, we see tremendous growth from 215,000 in 2002 to 316,000 in 2010. And we shouldn't ignore necessarily that additional 2.7 million of non-traditional books because that's showing new opportunities for writers and creators to, to do things. Uh, and the ebook market, especially, is growing so fast that when we charted that out, we realized we had it charted out by growth by quarter because it was so fast that if we did growth by year, it didn't necessarily demonstrate how fast that market was growing. The music market is also growing in terms of the amount of content being produced. In 2001, uh, various databases show that there were approximately 11 million recorded tracks. Um, now that may be slightly underestimated, but by 2011, that number was 100 million, so an increase of tenfold. Even if we assume the original number were undercounted by half, we're still talking an increase of fivefold. Uh, Nielsen, which covers uh, the, the um, major label releases, said that there were 38,000 album releases in 2003. That number practically doubled by 2010, 70,000 releases. And Nielsen only covers really the major labels and some of the larger independent labels. A single company by the name of TuneCore, which helps independent artists release music, said in 2009 alone, they released through TuneCore 90,000 releases were done. Uh, the industry says that there were a total of 70,000 releases in 2007, yet TuneCore, one company, said they alone did more than that, 90,000 releases. The video game industry is also growing at a massive rate. Um, there were approximately 250 million people worldwide who played video games in 2008. That number is 1.5 billion in 2011. Some of that is due to new and different markets, including social games and mobile games. So for consumers, from all of this, what we see is that it is a time of absolute abundance. There's more content than ever before. There's more availability from e than ever before. And at the same time, they're spending more on entertainment. For all the talk of that people just want stuff for free and that they're infringing because they, they want access to things for free, when we looked at the actual data, we saw an increase in the amount of spending as a percentage of household income from 2000 to 2008, an increase of 15% on how much was spent on entertainment. If we believe that the purpose of copyright is to encourage that kind of abundance and that kind of new works and that sort of access for consumers, we should be celebrating this and looking at all that has been done right rather than talking about concerns and increased enforcement. Now for creators, it is certainly a time of opportunity but also a time of challenge. It is easier to create, to distribute, to promote, and to monetize content than ever before. And there are amazing new business models and opportunities that are coming about, thanks in large part to new services on the internet. Services like Kickstarter, Topspin, Bandcamp, TuneCore, Flatter are all new services that are enabling people to create, to distribute, to promote, and to monetize in amazing new ways, often by going direct to fans and not necessarily having to use intermediaries or large gatekeepers that traditionally controlled the market. And many of those things have come about because of 
good intermediary liability protection, things like uh, in the EU um, e-commerce directive in the EU, in the US the DMCA 512 or the CDA 230 sections. And this presents a great opportunity for creators to reach a global audience with fewer institutional barriers. Now there's still a challenge for them and that is that often one of a barrier of obscurity. Uh, but this is not a copyright issue. They are competing against many more content creators because of all of these new services and new abilities to do things. But there are ways to, to deal with that and that is an issue that has little to do with copyright, yet often the discussion focuses on copyright instead. In fact, what we've seen is that exceptions to copyright law, such as things, uh, such as fair use, um, has, a, has enabled many creators to do amazing new things, including things like mashups, uh, documentaries, and certain videos. Um, and studies have certainly suggested these days that many of these exceptions actually contribute more to the creative output than copyright itself. And so we are seeing more competition, but more growth. 43% growth over the last decade in terms of those who consider themselves independent artists as a full-time profession. So for traditional gatekeepers, however, there is the biggest challenge, and that is the challenge to remain relevant, and yet that is where many of the complaints are coming from, and that seems to be where many of this debate has been driven from. And as these companies who used to be in the role of gatekeeper and be able to control this market have discovered that they face competition from all sides, competition for creation, for distribution, for publicity, all lessen their power to control the market. These companies can and do have a role, but often that role is as an enabler rather than a traditional gatekeeper. So in summary, what we've seen is that the sky is rising, not falling, that the overall industry is growing in terms of revenue and value, and that is growing at an even faster rate in terms of the actual output of content, at an amazing rate, in fact. And con consumers are living in an age of abundance. The public has more content than ever before. Creators are living in a time of great opportunity, but certainly a great challenge to be heard above the competition. And then we have the traditional gatekeepers who are fighting to remain relevant in a changing market. These are many, many of these issues have not come up in this debate at all, and yet seem to be incredibly relevant to this debate. And so we wanted to make sure that they got included, and that was uh, a large part of the report. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mike. Uh, I would like to uh, thank Gabrielle and Marianne and ask uh, also our m speakers for the next pa panel, Mong uh, Kamaliani and uh, Tessel Melema, to come to the floor. Meanwhile, we continue with the next panel, and these are two uh, speakers uh, that uh, are very much engaged with the development of internet. And the first speaker is uh, Sebastiano Tufaletti. Uh, he is Secretary General of uh, PIN SME, an organization, an umbrella organization representing 500,000 European uh, SMEs mostly, uh, related to the, uh, uh, whose work is related to the development of ICT in, uh, uh, technologies. Uh, so uh, we, uh, I give the floor to, to uh, Sebastiano to, to, to disclose uh, the companies and the SMEs uh, point of view. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for the invitation today. My name is Sebastiano Tofaletti, and I'm speaking on behalf of PINSME, which is the European Association of ICT Small and Medium-Sized Enterprises. Just uh, very shortly, some facts about the organization I represent. It was founded in 2007 by an initiative of UAPME, the European Association of SMEs, which some of you may already know. PINSME is the first European association in the ICT sector uh, that, is that is exclusively focused on representing the interest of small and medium-sized enterprises. PNSME represents 50,000 enterprises, so I have to correct the figure was said earlier, uh, which employ uh, approximately 200,000 people across Europe. But if you're interested, this industry is made up of approximately 1 million companies in Europe, 99% uh, of which is SMEs, and they employ approximately 4 million people in Europe. PNSME members are 14 national associations of ICT SMEs. Next slide. Uh, this is just shortly to show you the uh, geographical coverage of the association across Europe. And you may know some of the logos there from, from your organizations in your countries. Next slide, please. Now, coming to the subject at hand, uh, what is at stake for uh, European ICT small businesses? Uh, first of all, 
we think that ACTA introduces measures that will create legal uncertainty on SMEs in the ICT domain for data that they transmit and host. Why? Because the signing parties undertake to ensure that criminal sanctions for aiding and abetting infringement on a commercial scale is available. This means that with the threat of criminal sanctions, small service providers may be pressured by right holders to cooperate with responsibility to deter infringements, for instance, by blocking websites, cutting off users, and so on. Moreover, the ACTA stands on statutory damages, opens up for litigation, and the risk of very large damage payments. In fact, article uh, rules in Article 9, there's probably a mistake there, uh, Article 9, not Article 8, states that signing parties shall have the authority to consider any legitimate measure of value the rights holder submits. And if this is interpreted as one copy equals one lost sale, you can imagine that this means gigantic financial risks. Finally, if SMEs that operate networks and services online are obliged to take on a private role in monitoring and policing, this would infer large costs on them. And this slide is about the role of essentially intermediaries, those who host or transmit content. The next slide is about uh, the SMEs that develop content, which is probably even a larger group, and it is where we want to concentrate on. So again, question is, what is at stake for European ICT small businesses? We consider that ACTA will hamper innovation and growth in SMEs that develop content and market it online. Why? Because as we said earlier, large right holders will threaten all internet service providers with the risk of very large damage payments. This was shown in the slide before. This risk will deter internet service providers from hosting innovative content and products developed by SMEs if this content is in competition with the one provided by a large right holder. And they will do so irrespectively of whether the claims are legitimate or not, just because they are afraid of the risk of a large damage payment. And as a conclusion, we think that the large right holders, I mean, a large right holder, for instance, will de facto be able to block the access to online market for SME innovative competitors just by threatening the intermediaries uh, of uh, a, a core suit, they will block the access to market. Of course, this will not apply to large companies because those who know the ICT market know the, uh, that the ICT global players, uh, they have, those who have a large IP portfolio use it in a very much in a defensive way uh, to prevent uh, each other from, uh, from, from suing each other. So, um, uh, for instance, lately, uh, the ICT global players, they have been, those you should know this, have been uh, filing uh, hundreds and thousands of patents, uh, not because they want to charge royalties on these patents, but uh, just as a defensive strategy. So large companies will certainly have a way to counterbalance each other. But we think that SMEs will not, and so this will hamper innovation and growth. Uh, I think this is, thanks. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Sebastiano. Now I uh, would like uh, uh, Regan McDonald uh, to take the floor. Uh, Regan is a senior policy advisor at Access. Access is a relatively new NGO, but very active. It has been created after the Green Revolution in Iran and advocates uh, access to internet, helps also uh, those that uh, need some assistance in order to, to access internet and to use it properly for disseminating information for using it. So you have the floor. Thank you very much and thank you for having me here today and good afternoon everyone. Um, well, we've already heard 
quite a bit about the process and content of ACTA. Today I wanted to speak a few words on support for ACTA in the broader context um, of the internet, which is a globally shared resource. Um, and this is, this is really my main point. ACTA is contributing to a fundamental shift in the way the world sees U.S. control of key internet infrastructure and the EU's support for free speech and democracy. Support for ACTA lends credibility to ludicrous proposals by other countries to end the current multi-stakeholder model of internet governance. Now, civil society and other respected institutions from the EDPS to the OSCE to the EESC have long criticized this agreement. But worse still, for supporters of ACTA, countries that have been targeted by the agreement, such as Brazil and India, have also been very vocal in their opposition. Um, Brazil, for example, that has said that ACTA completely fails to find an adequate balance between the protection of intellectual property and consumer and human rights. The restrictions that ACTA promotes are coming at a time where governments around the world are also incre increasingly fearful of the freedoms and liberty that the internet and ICT gives its citizenry. Um, the UN Secretary General has recently said that dictators now fear tweets more than they do standing armies. So these factors combined have led to proposals by countries led by Russia to push for more control, more governmental control over the global and universal internet. Now, currently the internet is managed by what's called a multi-stakeholder model, where governments, private companies, civil society, and technologists all have a role to play where no individual party acts unilaterally. This light-handed and unpolitical approach to the internet is perhaps the very essence of what has made the internet such an explosive and dynamic success. However, this multi-stakeholder model is not enshrined into any law, and it's not universally accepted. From the dangerous proposals such as PIPA to SOPA and now ACTA, we see that other countries are increasingly encouraged by moves to change the structure of internet governance. Let's look really briefly at, at why and what damages ACTA would do for the online environment. First of all, is the trend to delegate the enforcement of the law into the hands of private companies. Article 27 of ACTA calls it cooperative efforts within the business community. And we've already seen this happening in Europe. In Ireland, for example, Aircom, its largest ISP, uh, voluntarily enforces intellectual property by suspending accounts for seven days um, to a year. The second issue is unilateral domain name seizures. And this has been an issue that is, has been led by the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency of the US, where basically if your domain name ends in .com, .net, .cc, or .tv, and so on, the US claims it fair game to unilaterally revoke it, regardless of the jurisdiction. This has already happened, for example, in 2008, um, a Spanish travel agency's website or domain names were, were revoked unilaterally without any court um, oversight and without having been accused of breaking any laws. So now, when the EU and the US and others push their excessive enforcement of intellectual property enforcement or their vision of what the internet should look like onto the world, it is only natural to assume that other countries will push back with what they want their vision of the internet to look like. Right now, the International Telecommunications Union, which is an arm of the UN and to this day has not had any real role in the policy and core functions of the internet, has been holding discussions on the future of internet governance. Now, some of these proposals that have been tabled by governments who wish to put more governmental control um, include um, regulating internet traffic, which would undermine the decentralized network, um, content-related proposals, everything from informational security to child protection, um, and expanding the international telecommunications regulations to address cybercrime and cybersecurity. Now, the ITU is an institution that allows only governments to have the final vote. It's extremely high 
price for membership means that civil society cannot participate, so only large corporations would have a voice. It also doesn't publish or make public any of its documents. So now third countries find themselves in a position where, on the one hand, do they want an internet where the US and others are pushing their jurisdiction into their digital borders? Do they want an internet where the global enforcement of IPRs are so high that they cannot innovate and make use of the, the good benefits of the internet to catch up to the developed world? Do they want an internet where legal certainty is compromised, where their domain names or sites or payment providers or ad networks could be blocked or deleted by the Googles and the Yahoos operating in their nations, or even worse, unilaterally by the US? Or on the other hand, do they want an internet where they can seek to have some sort of sovereignty and some sort of control over the process? We are right now in a very critical moment for the future of the openness and integrity of the internet. Governments that want to clamp down to silence speech and to control the internet have been watching very, very closely. ACTA lends credibility to proposals to balkanize the internet. And a balkanized internet would be devastating to human rights and global trade. The EU at this point does not want to tarnish its reputation as a supporter for free speech and democracy. And this is why we strongly urge the European Parliament to say no to ACTA and yes to an open and universal internet. Thank you. Thank you very much, Reagan. Uh, yet another perspective, and that's also one of the goals we have this afternoon to highlight the various angles uh, from which uh, people in civil society uh, with different organizations, uh, consumer rights, SMEs, uh, digital rights, human rights, uh, look at this um, treaty. Uh, and our next two speakers will deal with uh, the access to medicine question, which is yet another uh, issue that has been brought under the uh, uh, ever um, large umbrella that uh, ACTA has become. Um, several NGOs and scholars have raised strong concerns about ACTA hampering access to medicines. It is often stated that the increased liability measures in ACTA would make enforcement of IPRs easier at borders uh, and it would force the cooperation between private parties. We've heard that uh, in the context of the internet, but this would also play out uh, in the physical world when it comes to uh, the trade in medicine or the movement of medicine when they're brought to developing countries, for example. Uh, the measures are aimed to be a deter deterrent, so to prevent the trade in counterfeit goods. Uh, but by uh, enforcing this way, Okta could also increase the likelihood of wrongful seizures, uh, lawsuits, and thereby limiting or delaying the availability of generic medicine, which is legal, uh, to, uh, to developing countries and also would risk increasing their prices because of the complexity of this process. We have two speakers who will discuss uh, this issue from their expertise. Um, first of all, we'll hear from Moga Kamal Yani from Oxfam. Uh, Oxfam is well known to you, but an international confederation of 15 organizations working together in over 90 countries with partners and allies uh, around the world to find lasting solutions to poverty and injustice. The organization works directly with communities and seeks to influence the powerful to ensure that poor people can improve their lives and livelihoods and have a say in decisions that affect them also interesting in the context of ACTA. Um, Mishani is a senior health and HIV policy advisor and she has a lot of expertise with health policy uh, and programming in developing countries. So we look forward to uh, hearing from her about how ACTA might uh, impact access to medicine. Okay, so let's start by um, what are the patients um, saying about um, access to medicine. This is a picture of Thai um, HIV patients uh, demonstrating in support of generic medicines where two pills actually save their lives. So um, I looked at it from the provider side, the person who prescribes medicine. So I asked one of the doctors, um, why does she prescribe uh, med um, generic medicine? And she said, what? Of course, because they are cheaper. My patients cannot afford the originator price. So basically totally reliant on generic medicines. So 
Oxfam strongly oppose ACTA on public health grounds because we think it's ineffective, it's misleading, it's undemocratic, and it's dangerous. A lot of the previous speakers talk, talked about it being undemocratic and how it was uh, perceived and came to being, so, or came to potential being. So I'll, I'll leave that and I'll look at the other issues. So in terms of being ineffective, yes, we definitely have a problem with quality of medicines in developing countries. But bad quality of medicines has different reasons. I'm a doctor by training, so if you come to me with a headache, I can't just tell you, you know, let's go and have a, a brain surgery because you have a brain tumor. I actually have to diagnose you before and see that maybe all you want is correction of your eyeglasses, of, of your glasses. So therefore, we need to diagnose the problem uh, properly. So the problem of quality is a, is a health system problem. We don't have medicine quality regulators in developing countries. We don't have labs or not, not efficient labs who can do the testing, the, um, the, the, the workers who can actually look at the quality of medicine and ensure um, high quality and implementation of high quality. So if you want to help, you help there. Does ACT address these issues? No, it doesn't. So therefore, it's ineffective on public health grounds in terms of quality. ACT also is misleading because it uses the legitimate fear of bad quality medicine to push and enact um, intellectual property enforcement um, and create a new global framework of IP enforcement. Then ACTA is dangerous because it will undermine access to um, affordable quality medicine in developing countries. Because the scope is too broad, the scope of ACTA is too broad, it can turn legitimate generics, as you said, into counterfeit, and therefore people won't buy them. It combines third party liability with this expansive concept of counterfeit. So anybody who's involved in um, the product, whether the product is uh, uh, not counterfeit or even intentionally counterfeit. So if I provide, I don't know, the package or the label or the active ingredients or anything for that product, I'm also liable. So it, it sends a very chilling effect to generic, um, to anybody in the supply chain and it can affect the whole supply chain of medicines. So why, why do we worry about generic medicines? Because generic competition is the one thing that is, has proven to be effective mechanism for sustained reduction of prices. Not just a um, media headline reduction of prices, but a price that is consistently um, low. Um, currently, two thirds of all generic medicine used in low middle income countries are manufactured by generic companies, as it happened in India. And also, we must not forget the, the patients in the story, that most of the um, buying of medicine happens out of pocket, and it's a major cost for, for, um, for, for the patients. Um, according to WHO, there's 100 million people that fall into poverty every year. 100 million human beings become poor because of the cost of health care. A major part of that cost is medicines. So, and people are very sensitive to even few cents increase in the price. That means quite a lot to poor households. And of course, women are the last to benefit from health care, the last to seek health care, and the ones who really suffer the most. Um, generic medicines are key for treatment for infectious and non-communicable diseases. Let's, let's not forget that non-communicable disease is a rising epidemic in, in developing countries. But have we learned something from infectious diseases? for example, HIV. So these horizontal lines that are parallel to each other, each line represents one drug, one antiretroviral drug, and this is the price before the point when all the prices are coming down. That point is when generic competition enters the market, when the drug companies, and actually it happened in the EU, there was a, um, a meeting in, 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 uh, organized by the European Commission and the CEO of CEPLA, an Indian company, said, I'm going to offer three drugs in one pill. I'm going to offer it to governments in developing countries for $600 and for NGOs, $350. So basically, in one minute kind of thing, he got the price down from $10,000 per patient per year to 350
And after that, it was we lived through an amazing time when he set the benchmark and every company started to decrease in pr its price and other generic entered the market and the price started to come down and then it stabilized. I want you to look at the other picture on the top. We did this study in Uganda at the very beginning of um, um, scaling up treatment. And if you could see the number of patients just going, going up slowly, slowly, and then when the price starts to really come down, the number of patients starts to come up. So we're talking about why we like genetics, because it actually expands access to treatment. In conclusion, ACTA doesn't tackle the real problem. ACTA risks, risks outweighs, its risk outweighs its potential benefit to patent holder or to intellectual property holders. It endangers affordable medicine, especially now when everybody is talking about, well, country, countries are, donors are cutting their aid. Everybody's talking about value for money, about how to make price of products cheap so that um, donors can pay less. Um, so at that time, from one hand, you're saying, we want to pay less, and, for, and actually countries are paying less for aid. And on the other hand, you want to increase the price of medicine. It doesn't match. Mm -hmm. And actually, it leads to incoherence in, in the EU policies between DG development that is putting aid for health and DG trade, which is expanding, you know, increasing the price of medicine via, via this um, process. So therefore, ACTA should not be ratified by the EU. And any style, ACTA-style provision should just not be imposed on developing countries. And I'd like to see you with, to leave you with this picture. Right. This is Sue, um, a young girl that I got to know in Zambia a few years ago. When, I, when first I saw Sue, she was actually dying of HIV. She's an, aid, an AIDS orphan anyway. She was dying of HIV. I can't tell you how, it, how she looked when I first saw her. Um, this is a few years later. Thanks to genetics, she's alive. I'm glad to tell you that she has passed her 12th grade. Um, she got her certificate, and this is like secondary school certificate, and now she's going for training to be a businesswoman. So she can run her own business and manage her own life. And that's because she was put on this magic treatment um, that was affordable to the international community via genetic competition. Please don't let ACTA kill people like Sue. Thank you. Thank you very much. And next we'll hear from Tessel Mellema. She's with Health Action International, which is a uh, non-profit European network of consumers, public interest NGOs, healthcare providers, academics, media, and individuals with tw over 25 years of experience. Um, they represent the voice of civil society and poor and marginalized people in medicine policy debates. Thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity uh, for Health in Action International to uh, share our concerns of ACTA's impact on access to medicines. Uh, Moga from, uh, from Oxfam just um, explained the main health concerns and also explained the crucial importance of, of uh, uh, generics, and uh, thanks for that. And I will be try to be compl complementary by uh, focusing on the legal basis for the, these um, health impact concerns of ACTA on access to medicines. And then I would like to start with the name uh, of the uh, of ACTA Anti Counterfeiting Agreement, and maybe we can go to the first uh, slide. Um, that name uh, is misleading because um, actually, if we look at uh, it's the previous slide, or isn't it? Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, the name anti counterfeiting is misleading because if we look at the definition in WHO of counterfeiting, it says, um, and you can read with me. That it's medicines that are illegally and deceptively mislabeled with respect to identity and or source. If we then look at uh, IPR infringements, then there is only an overlap with one specific type of IPR infringement, and that is the use, and then even the intentional and willful use, of an, a, a sign that is identical to a registered trademark. All other types of IPR infringements have nothing to do with trade and counterfeit. So ACTA, and um, Oxfam also pointed that out, um, uses this public health rationale as a pretext to push for stronger IPR enforcement rights. But this pushing for stronger IPR enforcement rights come at a price, and then maybe we can go to the next slide. 
because this pushing for um, stronger enforcement rights increases the risk and threat of litigation and sanctions for generic competitors, and they are so important for bringing down prices, which is crucial uh, to ensure access to affordable medicines. And this, and this was also explained by uh, Jamie Love earlier, this happens when the risk of threats and litigation become too high um, um, and start working as a disincentive for competitors or generic competitors to engage in healthy competition. And this causes a chilling effect on generic competition. And this risk is also not hypothetical because we can see from the DG Competition Pharmaceutical Sector Inquiry in 2009 um, that pharmaceutical company, companies um, have engaged in a systematic uh, actions to use IPR enforcement measures to delay generic competition in the European market. And this has reportedly cost European citizens over 3 billion euros. And ACTA contains several such, exactly such strong, too strong IP enforcement measures that can chill generic competitions without sufficient guarantees and anti-abuse provisions that protect generic competitors and that strike the right balance. Um, I will, there, are, there are many concerns we have with the ACTA's impact on access to medicine, but I will focus on two, um, two measures because of the limited uh, time. And the first is, and um, Marie de Schaken also mentioned it uh, shortly, is um, uh, the right of customs to seize medicines uh, at the border. This right of customs, and they can act upon their own initiative or they can act upon the request of an IP right holder, a pharmaceutical company, this right is not limited to uh, counterfeits. Um, but applies much broader also to broader trademark infringements and copyright infringements. So this right can also be invoked, so goods can also be seized at the border in case of ordinary commercial trademark disputes. And such common trademark disputes are, are common occurrence in the pharmaceutical sector and, in, and, and by generic competitors. They're part and parcel of healthy competition in the generic market. And that is also logical because uh, generic uh, competitors are often um, required and have a justified reason to stay close to the brand originator name, for example, because the brand originator name uh, makes a reference to the active pharmaceutical ingredient. Or, for example, they need to stay close to the labeling or co color coloring of the packaging to indicate a bioequivalence with the originator product and to help consumers to choose for the cheaper generic. A second problem with the border measures is that it also allows uh, IPR uh, uh, right holders to enforce these measures in an in, in transit area. And this means that they can exercise these commercial trademark rights in an area, an in transit area, where they normally cannot exercise such rights. So these border measures give a strong enforcement tool in the hands of IP right holders, and in this case pharmaceutical companies, to delay and hinder uh, generic trade. And this risk of abuse or misuse of these border measures becomes even greater because it's performed by customs authorities and customs authorities are not equipped or competent to assess or to make the complex legal assessment involved in uh, commercial trademark infringement. Such assessments should happen by a judge and not at the border. And there's also no public health rationale for this broader um, scope of trademark infringements because um, this is much broader than, than counterfeiting. And a good example is uh, when in 2009, the German uh, customs authorities temporarily, for f more than four weeks, uh, detained uh, a batch of generic antibiotics called amoxicillin for alleged infringements of a trademark um, by, um, from uh, GlaxoSmithKline. Um, and, um, uh, and then four weeks later, they found out that amoxicillin actually refers to the active uh, pharmaceutical ingredient, so there was no trademark infringement and the goods were detained. Oh, were released. A second uh, concern um, is that ACTA puts this broad group of third parties at risk of criminal and civil enforcement measures, and we heard this before. Uh, and as also Oxfam um, explained, this puts a very puts literally the whole generic supply chain at risk of criminal and civil enforcement measures. That includes suppliers of active ingredients, but even the wording is so broadly formulated that it could even include NGOs procuring uh, generic medicines for treatment. Well, this and other IP enforcement rights in ACTA are therefore biased, lack procedural guarantees and anti-abuse pr um, um, provisions to protect generic competitors. And therefore, they, these examples show how, and then we can go to the last uh, slide, how um, um, the conflation 
between the need to combat counterfeits and IPR enforcement in general um, has led to far-reaching IP enforcement rights that have a chilling effect on generic competition. Um, and moreover, these far-reaching uh, uh, measures, they lack any public health justification and merely serve the interests of originator um, private companies, pharmaceutical companies. And the concerns become all the more immediate because ACTA is designed to be exported and become a global norm, uh, first to middle-income countries, then to developing countries. This risk of ACTA chilling generic competition, which is crucial for bringing down prices of medicines, seems a high and unacceptable price to pay for serving these private interests. And as Moga also uh, rightly uh, pointed out, this is also not only a problem affecting developing countries, but also within Europe the price of uh, medicines becomes a problem. And that we can see from uh, recent price cuts by the Greek government and earlier price cuts by the German government. So the conclusion can only be that ACTA is against the, in, in its current form, is against the interest uh, of public health and unacceptable uh, for EU citizens. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Now, now uh, moving to the last uh, speakers, uh, I would like to invite them first uh, uh, on the, uh, uh, the uh, to take the floor here on the on the podium uh, and. Uh, while they are coming, I would like to introduce uh, Jan Malinowski, who is uh, head of the Information Society and Media Department of the Council of Europe. And uh, Mr. Malinowski has been responsible for a number of standard setting activities in respect of media and freedom of expression, information, uh, as well as uh, internet governance uh, within uh, this uh, organization, the Council of Europe. And uh, I'm sure that he's going to uh, give us a very good uh, insight uh, from the point of view of the Council of Europe on, on ACTA and the issues it is tackling with. You have the floor, yeah. Thank you very much. And <clears throat> thank you very much for uh, inviting uh, me to be here. I think it's a, a very important debate that you are having. Uh, and the caliber of your speakers uh, actually speak to that. Uh, I don't think I have much to add to what has been said. So let me try to, to change the angle a bit. Uh, I read on uh, today's Le Monde uh, that Paul Brigner was hired by the Motion Pictures Association of America about a year ago <coughs> to defend the interest of the so-called copyright in industry. Uh, he moved to ISOC, to the Information Society, to the Internet Society which is an organization that uh, defends the freedom of the internet. And he said, apparently, or he's reported to have uh, said that to, to legislate uh, technological procedures is wrong and it's a dangerous thing in respect of technology. Now, another little anecdote that uh, uh, stems from something that has been uh, said earlier is uh, that when I buy uh, medicines at the pharmacist, the pharmacist actually writes the uh, non-generic, the brand, on the generic uh, medicines box. Uh, I wonder whether that would qualify under Article 5D uh, of the general definitions of ACTA. And consequently, if I were to transit uh, via an airport or be controlled by the police, whether I would be infringing uh, the, the, the law. Uh, or even if my pharmacist is infringing the law when doing that. Now, let me take a step back and say that the Council of Europe uh, is very attached to intellectual property rights and to copyright. It has, over the years, adopted a large number of texts where copyright is protected uh, and, uh, and promoted. Uh, Property is a fundamental right that is protected under Article 1 of Protocol 1 to the European Convention on Human Rights. And stemming from that, there are a number of provisions in other uh, conventions, like the Cybercrime Convention in Article 10, a convention that was negotiated within the framework of the Council of Europe, that protects uh, intellectual property and copyright. We have 
a satellite uh, transmission convention that uh, dating back to 93 that protects uh, neighboring rights, which is like copyright, but in a particular context. We have uh, uh, different soft law instruments, recommendations protecting the neighboring rights of broadcasting organizations and so on and so forth, uh, promoting uh, education and awareness in respect of copyright and intellectual property and so on and so forth. Now, there are legitimate reasons why one would protect uh, copyright and intellectual property right. There are legitimate reasons as well why one would want to um, <coughs> prevent the, uh, um, uh, the, 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 the marketing and the, and the negotiation of counterfeit uh, medicines. And that is why we also have uh, a convention that uh, seeks to proscribe and to penalize that. But it doesn't do it on the basis of intellectual property. It does it on the basis of the risks to public health. And that is a very important distinction. Now, I said that I wouldn't be saying uh, much new. I think that what I have said until now is what is new. The rest you have, you have heard. Uh, <clears throat> Overprotecting intellectual property in the way that it is uh, sought now uh, provokes a number of risks. Over-policing, for example, and policing by private actors as well. Surveillance beyond what is reasonable and what is uh, not necessarily justified on the basis of reasonable suspicion, which has been the, the, uh, the justification until now why judges would authorize certain forms of surveillance. There are risks to privacy. There are risks to freedom of expression. I won't go into the details. There are risks even to development. We heard it in respect of, of uh, the business and, uh, and uh, business communities that depend on, on, on the possibilities to, to, to work on what is out there in order to innovate, in order to, to, to develop uh, uh, new things, new products, new services, and so on. There is a lack of a potential lack of proportionality, which is required from a human rights perspective uh, as well. So there, there are direct risks, and there are also potential collateral uh, risk, collateral damages that can be provoked. We heard about gatekeeping. Perhaps the notion of gatekeeping has to be explained a bit more. Gatekeeping is not about conveying content, about transmitting con content. It's about controlling content. When we are talking about the major gatekeepers, what we are talking about is uh, the ones that control the content that is disseminated and broadly disseminated to the public. These are uh, 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 enterprises, companies, that would like their content to be uh, bought, uh, acquired by, by customers to the detriment, preferably, the, the business is to, to sell as much as possible, more than uh, their competitors, possibly to the detriment of other content, content that would uh, create diversity in the market, that would create diversity in cultural expressions, uh, and so on and so forth. There are risks <coughs> that the, the current trends uh, mm -hmm. tend to uh, prevent the development of new business models, that they uh, end up leading uh, the internet to a situation where uh, walled gardens and, uh, and uh, separate areas in the internet uh, develop. The purpose of uh, policy making should not be to uh, try to protect outdated business models. That would be contrary to the principle of market economy. I said at the outset, there are legitimate reasons why we would want to protect intellectual property. But beware with overprotecting, and beware with protecting for the wrong reasons. Uh, 
I think I will leave it there. I, I, I suspect that I already overdid my time anyway. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, and also for considering our time. We were a bit ambitious uh, in letting so many people uh, take the floor. We knew that, but we also knew it would be worth your time, and we appreciate your patience. Uh, and we know that there will be a lot of opportunity for ongoing debate, whether it is online or offline. Because uh, I want to give um, the floor now to um, Professor Kinderler. He is a very well-respected professor uh, and a member of the European Group on Ethics in Science and New Technologies. Uh, he serves at a number of universities, uh, for example, as professor of intellectual property law in Cape Town, as a professor of biotechnology and society at the University of Delft. This is a technical university. He is the former director of the Sheffield Institute of Biotechnology Law and Ethics and an honorary professor of biotechnology law at the University of Sheffield in the UK. To say three uh, words about the uh, European Group on Ethics and Science in New Technologies. Um, uh, this body is an independent, pluralist and multidisciplinary body which advises the European Commission on ethical questions relating to sciences and new technologies, either at the request of the Commission or at its own initiative. And in order to promote a responsible, socially inclusive and ethically sound implementation of the digital agenda, European Commission President Barroso has requested that the uh, group issues an opinion on the ethical implications of information communication technologies. So I could hardly think of anyone more um, uh, equipped and knowledgeable to uh, to conclude on this multi-stakeholder and stakeholder discussion on ACTA. Please, Professor. Thank you very much and thank you for giving me the opportunity to comment. It's really very interesting from many perspectives and I have to speak as an individual although I chair the EGE now. The um, EGE spent a year looking at ethical issues related to information and um, computer communication technologies. At no stage did the European Commission mention ACTA during that full year, to the point where when we produced our report in January this year, we had to say that had we known about ACTA, we would formally have commented quite clearly on that particular treaty. We didn't. The report, the, the um, Opinion is now in the hands of the Commission and is available on the website. Hard copy copies which should be available in the next week or so and uh, members of the European Parliament, of course, will get copies. I also work at the University of Cape Town and I chose to do so because I'd been speaking about developing country issues for a long time and it seemed to me that I shouldn't be talking from Europe only. So I spend at least half my time in an emergent country rather than in Europe. What we're talking about is a balance between individual rights and commercial rights. And I think this particular treaty errs very badly on the side of commercial rights and ignores the individual. We should have society and individuals on one hand, creator and inventor on the other hand, and if you can have a third hand, the state as the third hand of this balance in the rights of individuals. We talk about a number of issues in ACTA. Let me take them individually first. One, copyright. We're trying to ensure both civil and criminal law action on infringement of copyright in the area particularly of the internet and electronic communication. What we're actually saying is we have laws which are ignored by 90% of the population of the world. That virtually every single person now, except those in prison, has broken copyright law in the last year, almost certainly. And that, therefore, one could argue that we should empty the prisons of their current, current uh, population 
and put everybody else therein, because that's what this treaty actually requires. And that's very serious. If you produce a law which implies infringement by almost everybody, then the law is an ass, not the people. And we should be very aware of that. Secondly, there's an implication in this treaty which has been amply expressed by those talking about generic medicines, that counterfeit medicines and generic medicines are essentially the same. That's wrong, very wrong. And we should be absolutely aware of the implications of such an assertion. Approximately 200,000 patents are registered annually in the United States or Europe or Japan or South Korea. 200,000. Approximately 8,000 are registered in South Africa. And the whole of the rest of Africa has less than that 8,000. That is, 90% of all patents that are registered in Europe and the United States are never registered in Africa. They can copy them with impunity. What this tries to do, I believe, is to ensure that that which has been registered in Europe and the United States is applied in African countries even though the inventors have chosen not to register them in their own countries, in those countries, because they're not commercially useful. We're going to hurt others simply because the law doesn't allow us to hurt them at the moment. It's very frightening from a point of view of somebody who works in Africa. Chair, to me, this legislation may be legal. It may have changed during the last few months of its negotiation to something that actually meets the requirements of EU law. But morally, it doesn't. Particularly in relation to those who may well be forced to accept this treaty once the big countries have. And that is of great concern and should be to the European Parliament as well. What I've heard today made me even more concerned at what this piece of legislation is doing. We've heard over the last few weeks in the United Kingdom that the British government is bringing in new law in relation to um, the ability to look at where emails have come from, who you're talking to, and so on. Is this an implementation of ACTA? I think it is. It's extremely worrying, and even though I can't speak other than as an individual, I'm worried by that which is being presented to us. Thank you. Thank you for that very clear um, statement, Professor. Uh, I will give the floor to my colleague, Ifailo Kalfin, uh, and uh, then I'll say some concluding words. And we're very, very sorry that there's no time for more interaction, but... Uh, we'll continue online. Yes, it won't be the last word about ACTA, you can be assured. Thank you, um, uh, Mariette. Just, uh, uh, just uh, two sentences. Uh, I think that, that uh, uh, in the last two hours uh, we have been even more convinced that Internet is not about the wires and about uh, uh, gigabytes and about uh, sizes of information. It's about communication. It's about networking. It's about uh, opportunities for uh, businesses. It's about opportunities for uh, health. It's about uh, rights. It's about instruments to assure the uh, preservation and the implementation of fundamental rights that uh, we all have and we all would like uh, that they are universal uh, anywhere in the world. So when uh, speaking about uh, uh, um, finding the tools on internet uh, to enforce legislation, uh, we have to uh, change the paradigm. 
And I think that the paradigm should be not to limit or to restrict or to police or uh, name it uh, uh, internet, but we have to use uh, the tools of the uh, 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 of the techno technology, uh, the tools that internet provides in order to enforce the laws, and not uh, vice versa, not to enforce the laws by limiting uh, uh, the perspectives and the opportunities that are created by internet. Uh, I thank uh, everybody who took part in this, uh, in this uh, debate. I thank everybody who is present at this debate and who uh, was uh, listening on the web streaming of the debate. Uh, of course, we shall continue, it, it, uh, continue uh, online until the parliament takes its final position, but I think that what uh, we have heard today is very, very convincing about the deficiencies of this agreement and uh, about uh, the lack of arguments to support it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philo. I think uh, we have all learned something new today, at least I have, and I've spent some hours studying ACTA, but listening to these different voices has again uh, shed new light and uh, indeed very concerning light on uh, what is before us. We've heard different voices, and I would like to thank specifically all the speakers for preparing, for coming over, for making time and being with us this afternoon. Uh, we've talked about the failures in the process of uh, the establishment of the ACTA Treaty, about access to medicine, access to information and sharing knowledge. We've talked about the implications of identifying damages and the questions of who should be uh, liable and responsible for breaches. Uh, we've learned that uh, the sky is rising, not falling, or the pie is uh, getting bigger, not smaller. And we've asked ourselves how ACTA would be enforceable without compromising individual fundamental human rights. Free speech, access to information and human rights are not only an issue that should concern us and our EU citizens, but are a global issue, especially in an increasingly connected and interdependent world. And um, we also learned that uh, there is a concern that ACTA goes directly against the vision of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And I think that is a very serious uh, statement. We should also be concerned about the role that Europe plays in this connected and, and globalized world. Um, we should be credible and ambitious in leading to enhance people's freedoms and human rights instead of balkanizing the internet or uh, being complacent in limiting people's rights. We need to also play our role as a European Parliament to uh, guarantee democratic oversight and to ensure checks and balances. Now what is the alternative? Uh, even though we are critical of uh, the way ACTA has played out now, it does raise some relevant questions. Uh, there are some serious health concerns and other concerns uh, when it comes to the impact of counterfeit. Um, but the right answers are still to be found. So I would also encourage you to think about the alternative. I think that is very important in not just dismissing what is before us, but what would be the solution. Say no is easy, but let us invest also in finding an alternative. And I think uh, that part of the alternative will lie in sectoral approaches. We've heard today how many different aspects uh, come into play at ACTA, and we really could have had twice as long a meeting and had even more voices with completely different uh, input. Um, a sectoral approach would allow for a more effective and specific uh, approach instead of a very general um, treaty which uh, has a lot of collateral impact on uh, various um, sectors. We can then uh, look at how to prevent um, trade, for example, in, in counterfeit medicine without uh, hurting um, uh, generic medicine. We can look at how opportunities of the digital economy and the uh, developments in new technologies can actually be used for consumers, for small and medium-sized enterprises, for users and audiences, for artists and creators, uh, without causing collateral damage. And we can ensure that there is oversight in the process and that fundamental rights are respected. And we must also not try to reinvent the wheel. Some uh, very adequate sectoral approaches and measures and treaties already exist. Uh, the Metacrime Convention that the Council of Europe developed is one of those examples which uh, deals with the uh, trade in counterfeit medicine. Uh, I'm always interested in making politi politics and um, the decision-making process as lean as possible and not complicated and uh, creating extra bureaucracy. So uh, let's use what we have and not reinvent the wheel. In thinking about alternatives to ACTA, we may also find ourselves at a time where it is 
really not relevant or legitimate anymore to say that the trading counterfeit goods, which are tan tangible, can in, all, in any way be compared to uh, sharing information and knowledge and cultural content online. So we may have to separate out questions about copyright enforcement online or so-called piracy questions uh, and the counterfeit of tangible goods. Now the European Court of Justice has been asked for an opinion uh, by the European Commission. The European Parliament has for the moment cho chosen not to present its own question uh, and to go on with the original timeline, which would lead to a vote in June or probably July uh, of this year. But uh, some people have looked to this opinion by the European Court of Justice as though this would present a magic solution. But it can only answer the question whether ACTA is legal, as the professor said. But there are more uh, questions than just that, uh, about the implementation, for example, and about the legitimacy. Uh, and uh, whether it's morally just is a judgment that we could all uh, assess for ourselves and that the court uh, will probably not highlight. So all in all, I think uh, it, it has become even more clear today that ACTA does raise some of the right questions but does not provide the right answers and that we must think of alternatives. And I hope that we will all be a part of that and uh, look outside of our own bubble, outside of our own network or field of expertise uh, to learn from each other and to work together to ensure that Europe is relevant, uh, credible, and that we use the opportunities and guarantee fundamental rights of people uh, without collateral damage, such as what ACTA would do. So thank you very much uh, for being a part of that. We'll put the video of today's meeting online if you want to share it with others who couldn't uh, watch live or be here. Uh, and I want to thank everyone again and wish you a great afternoon.